and we're live with one of my first early morning sessions so you can see the sun kind of coming through the blinds here uh blocking me but i'm with uh stacy varney stacy good morning good morning thanks for taking time out of your schedule happy to join you on a sunny morning here in maine as well I know. So we got the, hopefully the entire East Coast is finally basking in some springtime weather. Uh, we're going to be talking about insurance and claims and insure tech. And so, uh, Stacy, why don't you introduce yourself and your company and uh, spend a couple minutes. Give us an elevator pitch. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Great to be here. Thank you, Nick, for inviting me. Um, my name is Stacey Varney, and I'm the Global Head of Sales and Marketing for Claim Vantage. Claim Vantage is a technology company focused in claim management and leave management. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is. We're a SaaS company. The company um, was built back in 2006 with um, the founder, Leo Corcoran, who had been in the technology sector for about 30 years decided that he wanted to build his own company and he wanted to do it differently. So he started the company out um, wanting to provide an entirely new experience for people that manage claims um, in the life and health um, sector of the business. And so that, that was our primary focus in the beginning. And um, he started the company and started building the company, launched the first product in 2008, and shortly after that, he realized that it wasn't different enough. So he reframed. It was an interesting time, 2008, as yes. many of us remember. So he reframed and said, you know, I need, to, I need to really think outside of the box. And that's when he decided that he was going to rebuild the software on the cloud. So we became cloud native uh, 10 years ago. He chose Salesforce as the platform after after a lot of consideration of other options. And I remember fondly back then, because I knew Leo before I joined the company, um, that he was truly a visionary building a claim technology system on Salesforce Cloud back in 2010, when still most people didn't know what cloud was. They only knew Salesforce as a CRM solution. And um, it, was, it was a very bold move for him at the time. And one that's proven to be, you know, just a brilliant um, decision. Yeah. So uh, it's it's uh, it's funny. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Um, uh, going back that far, when you say something like, you know, what th there was there weren't a lot of visionaries when it came to the cloud, which is like really funny. And sure. I remember specifically working with a couple of companies that made software that just like give us the use cases. Like we can't think of any you know, where the cloud is. And here it is, like, it just, it, it really took a visionary to kind of think forward on what the cloud was go actually going to do. But I digress. I apologize. Uh, please continue. No, no, it's, um, it's great. I, I agree with you. And, and I remember at the time I was with a large global reinsurer. I was interacting with Leo in the industry. And, you know, I, I was introducing him to insurance companies at the time. I yep. just really liked him and what he was all about. Um, he's Irish, so everybody loves to talk to him, you know, and um, he's lived in the States for about 20 years, but he has not lost that wonderful accent. And, um, you know, I introduced him to a lot of my clients at the time. And, you know, some people just thought, what is he thinking? You know, what is this cloud all about? Yeah. How, how safe is our data out on the cloud? Who you know, owns it? Right. Well, what, again, what is the cloud? What does yeah. that mean? And um, and, you know, the events of the past few months have only solidified the fact that he made a wonderful choice. And and, you know, customers, obviously, that have adopted our technology and are cloud based and have been, um, you know, their their move to remote work was so easy and seamless. Um, there were no business continuity issues. So. Yeah. Cloud was a great choice. He hadn't probably anticipated, you know, what would happen 10 years later and, um, and the impact that cloud technology would have on the entire, you know, industry and, and not just the insurance industry. Right? Yeah. So. Um, can you, so I, I heard you say life and health, correct? 
Yes, and that's a broad term. So we're not in the PNC business, we're in the life right. and health business. So the products, man the products managed on our claims solution run the gamut from life and disability to all of the voluntary products um, that carriers sell, both individual insurance companies, group insurance companies. Um, we are a global company. Um, so we have insurance companies spread out across, we call them three different geos, North America, EMEA, and APAC. And we've got, um, we've got offices in all three locations. So our home office is actually in Dublin and um, we have a team of about 40 people there. It's mostly our development team, um, not 100%, but mostly development team. And, um, and then our office in Portland, Maine is, I'd say mostly the business team. So if you think about um, people with deep industry expertise in insurance and, and leave management, and I'll, I wanna talk a little bit about that as well. And then we have an office in Melbourne, Australia, and, nice. um, and that team supports our customers in APAC, um, but you know, they're, they're a combination of both business developers and I just recently hired a new sales exec um, there as well. Yeah. Um, Offsites must be awesome. Surf, surf in Melbourne, lobster in Portland, and Guinness in Dublin. Pretty much, pretty <laughs> much. There's a, there's a, there's a lot to do in all three locations. Um, but you know, the geographic um, differences makes it challenging at times. Um, we often find that we, you know, we have to accommodate early, early morning meetings to get everybody on the phone or sometimes, you know, late evening meetings to get everybody on the phone. Um, but fortunately, it's such a wonderful team and everyone really enjoys interacting that we make it work. Uh, so uh, the, the name claim is in your uh, name. It's in your, uh, uh, the name of the company. So can you uh, talk about like particular use cases? So it's a SaaS company. Is it, um, you had mentioned leave as well, but can you talk about the types of claims that your software handles and automates? Yes. So we have three primary markets that we serve. Um, insurance carriers globally, third-party administrators globally, and then large corporate accounts, so large employers um, in the U.S. today. And so our, our software accommodates all three of those, um, those market segments. Okay. Um, and again, you know, all claim types in that life and health sector. So for example, in APAC, the, the, uh, what we would call worksite products in the US, they call health products, um, critical illness, you know, cancer, for example. Disability. Uh, exactly. Even Accident. like long-term care. Um, yes, yes. yes. I mean, okay. that's not as common in the global markets as it is in the U.S. But, um, you know, they call them different things. So disability in APAC and actually in Europe is called income protection. So IP um, or, you know, total and permanent um, uh, TP, you know, uh, claims. So different varietals, but essentially the same products. Yep. Um, and so, you know, yes, in the U.S. it's it's life and disability it's um, all the same critical illness, you know, accident, hospital indemnity, like the entire voluntary suite of products that are offered here. Yeah. Um, and then leave management. I did want to talk about that a little Please. bit. So um, in 2012, Leo started to think, again, you know, the visionary that he is, what's the next thing that our, that our software could could solve for what problems are our companies having that we could help solve for and you know the family medical leave act had been enacted you know years before and carriers were starting to really struggle with how to manage um, fml on behalf of their insurance customers and third-party administrators as well and so we decided to get into the leave management business and at the time it started as fml family medical leave um, and the industry refers to it fondly as absence management. Um, most insurance companies, they got into that business primarily because they are insured business. Customers were asking, can you help us manage these leaves under the federal program? And, um, and then, you know, like ASO STD, I don't think most insurance companies love to offer that service, but they do it so they can get the, you know, the longer tail risk, the long-term disability and the life and, and other products. 
Um, so we, we hired an expert in the absence management field, um, Angie Brown, and she came in and started working with the developers to build our, the first version of our absence management solution. And that was in 2012. And we wrote our first customer, you know, shortly thereafter. And that has been just a significantly growing business for us um, because it also is what brought us into, into the large corporate market. Um, large employers that didn't want to outsource their leave management to a, a third party administrator or to an insurance carrier wanted to manage their leaves in house. They didn't have the technology that allowed them to do that. Yeah. And so that opened up a new market for us. And it's been a really, a really terrific one. Yeah, could, could you talk about that specifically? Like um, when I'm fascinated when new markets get generated, uh, there are no customers and there are very few use cases where you can actually prove things out. So a lot, I think a lot of the heavy lifting is the, the sales effort to find pot potential business that's and then right. walk them through a sales process where it's just like they don't even know they have the problem or the problem is just emerging or, you know, or you have to s sell it to them that they have the problem. Can you talk about like the creation of that market and the effort that it took? You know, it's one thing to build software, but if you can't, if you can't sell it, you can't find the customers. How did you go about creating that market? Yeah, that's a great question. At the time, it was, okay, we need to hire somebody that knows the employer space. Right. So we did. We hired a sales uh, person to join the company that came from that large employer market, having worked for, you know, carriers in the past. And, and so he knew that the best way to get to the large employers is through the broker consultant uh, market. So okay. he started working his network. And then we started to look at, OK, where do large employers spend their time? You know, what industry groups do they participate in? Let's make sure we're connected to those groups as well. Um, and so it was, you know, literally just like down in the trenches, building, yeah. building the market. Um, and we knew we knew that there had to be large enough companies that didn't want to outsource, you know, the business. So we what we don't do is we don't cannibalize. Right. So we don't go to customers that are you know, large corporates, for example, that are working with insurance companies um, that are clients of ours. That is not at all what we're all about. Right. So but if a large employer says, look, we're bringing this in house or we're already managing it in house. And you would be horrified at the number of large employers that are managing these leaves on Excel or on some yeah. other very rudimentary kind yeah. of solution today. Um, and I should mention that, you know, so it started as family medical leave, but as is common in the U.S., once there's a federal program, individual states begin to think, well, that's great, but we can do it better. So, um, so states started to enact their own leave programs, paid family leave programs or paid family and medical leave right. programs. So, right, PFL, PFML, California. So you're, you're, you're potentially are running into 50 plus different variations of, of the benefit. Absolutely. So they still have to meet the federal requirements and then wherever they have employees in states that have their own PFL or PFML yeah. programs, they have to meet those requirements as well. And I mean, truly leading, leading up to um, this pandemic, I mean, it was, it was apparent that every year it was going to be another one or two states, you know. Um, we'll see if that activity slows down at all as a result of COVID-19. But, um, you know, already all of the, the largest states, the most populous states, um, have their own programs. And, and then others are looking at different variations of them. And so, so it's been this evolving issue for particularly the larger employers that have employees across many states. How do they keep up? You know, it's the, the regulations are changing all the time. And, and then even COVID-19, right? The federal government put in a new program for employers 500 lives and under within two weeks. Yeah. And so, you know, our team had to jump right on to as soon as, you know, first of all, as soon as we heard the feds were going to initiate a new program, we had to get in and understand it. As soon as it became 
law, you know, because you, you, they'll make a lot, of, a lot of changes as they go. So as soon as it became law, we literally, you know, took it into our product um, R&D team. We have a compliance expert on that team. You know, she immediately started to evaluate what the regs were all about. Um, we work with a partner company as well, a law firm that, you know, we use to just verify, okay, our understanding, our interpretation of the law. And then we went to work. Like we had to, we had to build a solution for all of our customers across those three segments um, within two weeks to make sure that they were ready to go and that they were going to be in compliance and make sure their client, their clients were in compliance with the regs that changed like that. Yeah. This is a classic case, right? Of um, probably when the law first comes out, it seems easy enough to manage it on a spreadsheet, but uh, it becomes unwieldy after a while. And it, um, it, 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 it's basically divorced from, your day-to-day -day business. So you have to supply all of these resources to this other thing just to manage something in-house, but has nothing to do with your business. That's right. And it's a classic case where it should be outsourced to someone who has expertise so that when something like COVID-19 pops up, their expertise can immediately get all of the wires connected to it versus the company having to disengage their business operations to do something that has nothing to do with their business. Absolutely. And all of that happened while employees, including the human resources man managers or the teams in, in HR, had to move home and start working remotely. Yeah. Yeah. So this was happening all at the same time, you know, for for all of these companies. And and this is a, a this has been a global issue, let's face it. Um, but you know, in terms of, of the regulatory changes um and it wasn't just the federal government that came out with um you know with, with the pr a new program um several states started to make modifications to their existing programs as well and so they had to kind of quickly shift gears if you were in one of the states that made those changes um yeah. with, with again it was about a two-week time frame from when when the law was enacted to when it was going to be effective and so it it was a very um, it was a very challenging time for businesses for sure, you know. Fortunately, as you mentioned, because because we have a process in place, because we've got the technology, the product, um, it was a very quick shift for us. Um, you know, I was very proud of our team. We we pulled together. You know, everybody's working remotely, which is is relatively easy, right, for us, a, a company like ours, to be able to do, um, and and then wrap their arms around the, the, the regulations, get the development work done, but then it was all communication. How are we gonna communicate it to all of our customers? We need to make sure they understand what's happening and, and what they needed to do to be able to update their, their software so that they were ready to go. You know, We had an all customer telephone call, 85 people on, on a phone call. You know, um, We set up a, a Confluence page. We used that for, um, for communicating with with our customers, um, they were asking, you know, live questions on it. I mean, it, you know, we had to leverage every bit of technology we had and our customers had to be able to get the work done in a, in a very short period of time. Yeah. It, it sounds as though Claim Vantage um, has the advantage that there was uh, by necessity, and I sort of think this is, this should be for any of the insure techs that are coming in that you had uh, somewhat of a sales DNA in your, in your company where, and I don't mean sales like actually selling and pitching, but the, the, you, you said the word um, in the trenches, the necessary work to sort of have your finger on the pulse of, especially when you're making a new market, having your finger on the pulse of how is this going to help potential customers? How is this going to solve problems? And constantly asking, trying to connect those dots from product development to actual real world solutions. And that's, that's a true sales process that I see missing from a lot of, uh, a lot of the insure techs that are coming through where, you know, um, Sales is thought of as like, well, that's not the hard part. The hard part is creating the product. But it, in reality, it's the trenches, right? 
And so can you talk about like, do you, do you feel as though claim, claim Vantage has sales in its DNA? Yes. You ask any employee at Claim Vantage and they will answer, yes, absolutely. And it starts at the top, right? So that is, that is Leo's mindset. Leo's mindset is, you know, we're here to solve problems. That's why the business exists. It's why the company exists. It's why every employee is here. You know, solving problems for the customers that we have and taking care of them yep. and then solving problems for customers that we don't have, markets that we don't serve yet. You know, how can we leverage what we've built in different ways. Right. And so it, that is absolutely a mindset. It is, um, it, it, and it does start with Leo. It is all about, um, you know, if we're not creating something new and constantly creating something new and constantly improving it, then we're standing still. I mean, the company was, bound, was, was formed on the basis that he never wanted to have a legacy system. Right. So yep. by moving to the cloud and by, yep. so and by we release on the Salesforce release schedule. So three times a year, we're putting new updates in the solution. And so three times a year, our customers are getting the latest and greatest that, that our team is putting together and bringing to the product. And, and so that is what, what's going to keep our customers ahead of the curve, you know, not behind the curve and not years behind the curve but not making sure that we're never legacy is, is absolutely core to, um, to our product R and D efforts. Yeah. Can, can you actually talk a little bit about the technology and the implementation, how you would engage uh, with a particular customer? I'm specifically interested with the Salesforce backbone of what it is you're doing. What if you have a customer that's like, Oh, well, we used to have Salesforce, but we don't anymore. You're going to make me go back to that, how, how is the engagement and how do you implement the software for uh, customers that um, may, have some, may have an alternative to Salesforce that they're currently using? That's a great question. So you need to separate out Salesforce, CRM, or the other solutions, you know, service cloud, you know, marketing cloud, separate those sales cloud, those things from the platform. Right, so we're built on the platform and native to the platform. Um, it it certainly is easier if we're talking to a company that already has Salesforce in their environment in some way, whether they're using it for CRM or for case management, some other um, capability that Salesforce brings to the table. It's easier because okay, they already see the value, they already have a relationship with Salesforce, and so. We're, you know, we can come in and say, this is another Salesforce product. If you think about the different products you have, this is another one. Um, in, order to, in order to run our solution, they need to have Salesforce licenses. Um, so that, that is key. But if they're a customer that may not have ever used Salesforce before, and of course, many of our corporate accounts haven't, um, they may have heard of it. Salesforce is the largest, you know, yeah. uh, cloud technology company um, in the industry, but if they haven't, then we very much describe Salesforce and all the advantages that Salesforce brings to us and to them as customers right up front. So we, you know, it, it is part of our sales pitch. You know, it is unrivaled security. It is absolutely about scalability. Um, it's functionality, right? Um, pro our products are highly configurable because they're built on the platform which is a highly configurable platform. And so, um, so we sell those advantages up front. But if a customer has said, oh, we've, you know, we've moved from Salesforce CRM to Microsoft Dynamics. So what do you mean we need to you know, get back involved with Salesforce? It's very easy. Well, you have to have Salesforce licenses to run our technology. So yes, you will need to have a relationship and a contract with Salesforce, but it, it's, it's for the platform use. Yeah, you don't have to, to. You don't have to. You don't have to re-engage with the CRM. Oh, absolutely. Element of it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So you know, I think as more companies build software on the platform, it'll be easier to explain that you know you can have a relationship directly with Salesforce for all of the great things that they sell as products directly to end users. Yeah. Um, but then the platform is the opportunity to leverage that great technology that's been built and all the advantages that come with it to, to build product on top of it. Yeah. So, 
Uh, and we're seeing it on the PNC side too. So we have had, uh, we have interviewed a, a couple of SaaS companies that deal with policy management systems that are, they're built on top of Salesforce. And so uh, it's very useful. I want to make sure the audience understands very useful to know that you don't necessarily have to get the full blown Salesforce license to take advantage of this. You just have to get a license that's kind of uh, linked with that. Um, it is it is amazing though. Um, when I was investigating uh, property casualty policy management systems, like the uh, the app, basically it's like an app store. The app exchange. For, yes, for a Salesforce and how how many companies are built on have built on that, similar to um, you know what you can find if you go to an Apple app store. Um, probably not as many because these are more sophisticated corporate solutions and not just games and stuff, but it's, it's, a, it's amazing how robust that is. I guess if you get that good, you can build a skyscraper in San Francisco. Yeah, it's, uh, well, the New York City location is pretty awesome too for Salesforce. I've been there. I haven't been to San Francisco yet, but to their office there. But um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, right? So the, uh, the app exchange is a great place to go and find various technology companies um, and capabilities that are there. You know, when I when I think about what Salesforce has done, and I I was a Salesforce CRM user, you know, for 20 years um, before joining the company, and I didn't even have a you know a great understanding of the platform capabilities when I joined ClaimVantage a year and a half ago. So I've I've learned a lot along the way, and I work with the Salesforce um, account management team for for our account. You know, I I work with them pretty much every every week. So I I continue to learn as I go. The, the app exchange is a place where, you know, you can go and look for, you know, various solutions. So you need a document management system and you get on the app exchange and you see, well, DocuSign, you know, is there. Um, or the two companies that Salesforce has acquired in recent years, MuleSoft and Tableau, are both solutions yeah. that many insurance companies use, right? Already. So for integrations and for, uh, for reporting. Um, yeah, so, I, think a lo- I think a lot of folks that would listen to this probably know um, Tableau. That's uh, that's very endemic in the insurance industry as a BI, a business intelligence tool, uh, reporting tool. So I, I actually didn't know that they had been acquired by Salesforce. Yes, yes, they have. And, um, and then as a result of acquiring a number of um, data analytics companies, they've put together what they refer to as Einstein. Right, so the data analytics, you know, predictive modeling, kind of all that wonderful data science uh, work that's inside of the the Einstein um, tool set. That's again inherent uh, inside of Salesforce. Yeah. So that ecosystem, and that's how they refer to it. That ecosystem just continues to get more robust, um, and uh, and and more helpful and useful to their customers yeah. um, over time. Yeah, I, I don't think we should understate that because uh, what essentially what you're saying is that um, folks that are potentially working with ClaimVantage on a Salesforce platform have uh, two options um, to continuously improve their process improvement in claims. One is as um, ClaimVantage continues to improve the software, they'll continue to get more benefits, but then they can plug and play with other pieces of the app store since they're already on Salesforce. So they can mm-hmm. plug into Tableau, they can plug into some of these other tools and keep advancing the, the Absolutely. analytics they can, or the, what my favorite term now, they can keep money balling their, <laughs> their business, you know, and, and really um, getting, getting uh, quality economics out of it. That's right. No, that's exactly true. Right. So and Salesforce invests, you know, billions of dollars um, as witnessed by these acquisitions. Right. In in making the company, uh, again, you know, more um, more user friendly, but also more broad reaching in terms of the capabilities. Um, So they also have organized Salesforce is organized by, you know, by vertical and the insurance vertical sits within, you know, within their financial services sector. It's their fastest growing sector, yeah. you know, and we're really proud to say that we're one of the leading ISVs within the Salesforce environment, um, you know, in the top three 
um, for for financial services. So they um, they appreciate um, the the relationship they have with us. They have what they call a partner program. They treat their um, their you know native companies companies inside of their ecosystems ISV partners like us. Um, you know, really well. They they want our feedback. They're constantly looking for, you know, how how are we doing? Um, what problems do your customers have? How can we help you solve those problems? Um, so there there really is a, a a true partnership in the relationship we have with Salesforce. Yeah. Um, any plans to uh, also? I'm selfish. You know, I do property casualty. Any plans to move into PNC? So I'm going to say we would never say never, um, but one of the things that I think Leo always wanted to make sure we did was maintain this deep industry expertise, mm -hmm. right? And so for that reason, we've been a niche player in this space. Like we haven't, we haven't moved into policy admin, right? I mean, some of our competitors have policy admin systems, yeah. and but we've stayed with a claim and leave management. Um, which lead management was a natural extension, right, of, of managing disability claims um, for our customers. Um, so same is true with, with PNC. Um, we get asked that a lot. We've looked at some workers' comp opportunities, uh, particularly, you know, uh, in Australia, for example. And the disability component of right. a workers' comp claim, of course, is a disability claim, so it seems right. very logical. But the health component is quite different. Um, so, you know, I... I say we have a lot of runway left in the markets that we serve with the products that we have to not kind of venture into the PNC waters. Um, but, you know, I'll never say never, you know, because if, if we decide that we can make a good charge there and um, we believe that our products are, you know, would be highly valued, um, then we consider that. So. Thank you for taking time out of your morning to uh, educate us. I Thank always you, like ben. learning. Uh, for, for anyone that's listening, as usual, stay safe. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Be, be kind. And um, all of Stacy's contact information, herself, Claim Vantage, and any appropriate links and the transcript to the show will all be on the show notes. So... Uh, you don't have to pull over to connect with her on LinkedIn. I will share that link with her. Stacy, thank you again so much. Thank you, Nick. Have a great day. You too. Be well. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country.